Hello, and welcome again to another edition of Public Affairs, Public Access. I'm your guest host, uh, David Hutzelman, and, and uh, my shows we usually talk about uh, uh, political landscape and public policy from basically a libertarian perspective. And from time to time I've asked, what exactly is a libertarian perspective anyway? So uh, just to start the show off uh, from the basics, Libertarians are generally people that believe in uh, less government, but uh, free markets and not the crony capitalism that characterizes today's economy, and are basically very strong on civil liberties and uh, believe that each person has a right to live their life the way they want to with their own lifestyles without any interference from the government. And generally from a, pub uh, from a foreign policy standpoint that uh, we're generally uh, very uh, non-interventionists and don't think that we have the answer to everyone's problems around the world, especially not uh, the ability just because we can bomb them into uh, annihilation that uh, we have better ideas about how they should run their own society than we do. Uh, that's just the political landscape for libertarians. There's also some libertarians that don't believe in politics and participation in politics at all. And uh, those are people that uh, believe in a very rigid uh, non-aggression philosophy, which is basically a libertarian philosophy that you don't have the right to initiate physical force or fraud against uh, anybody else in society, which leads to a society that's basically made up of voluntary relationships. So with those uh, basic points in mind, I'd like to start in on tonight's uh, uh, discussion. Uh, I have with me a uh, young lady who has been on the show before and uh, is a uh, particularly well-versed to talk about the subject tonight, which is going to be uh, basically uh, the political situation as it surrounds millennials. And I'll get uh, Corey to tell us exactly what millennials are, and maybe we'll have a, a little time to uh, kick around another political phenomenon these days, which is uh, Donald Trump. But uh, Corey uh, is a, uh, has a BA in history and politics from uh, Simmons University. She's worked for Young Americans for Liberty, and she currently blogs at a uh, place called uh, rarepolitics.com. Uh, and she's been a liberty activist from a long time, at least ever since I've known her. And uh, we're certainly glad to have her. Welcome to the show tonight, Corey. Thank you for having me tonight. I appreciate it. Okay, we're always glad to have you. And maybe you could start off uh, by uh, giving us a little definition of exactly who are these millennials and, and are you one of them? I definitely am a millennial. I'm kind of right in the middle of millennials, maybe kind of one of the older ones. Millennials are generally people defined as being born um, in the early 1980s, really through um, the early 2000s. And so there are some disputes as to the years, but generally um, it's been people who in the past were maybe 18 to 29, now moving a little bit further from that as younger generations come in. But I'm actually 29 myself, so I'm um, kind of an older millennial, but generally we are the ones who are kind of early 1980s to the two, early 2000s. And um, we have become a big deal politically, largely because we actually are the biggest generation in the country, even bigger than the baby boomers at this point. And so what we do politically has been looked at and analyzed and really Draw, drilled down into, and I know we're going to talk about some of those poll numbers and really what millennials believe politically because we're a lot more complicated than I think a cursory look would provide. A lot of people say that millennials are just liberal across the board, but when you drill down into it, there actually is a libertarian tendency and very much an anti-establishment tendency within the millennial generation that I think plays out politically in very different but distinct ways. Very good. I understand that millennials are kind of a conundrum to most of the political establishment because they're hard to uh, pigeonhole one one way or another. I, I guess I have a my first question is: Do millennials vote? I mean, are they uh, viewed as a potent voting block, or are they just as a a group of uh, people whose uh, opinions are generally uh, uh, characterized and, and categorized? 
I would say millennials vote at about the same rate as generations when they were our age do. Um, it is true that statistically the older you get, the more likely you are to vote. But millennials are coming out in droves, especially in this election. And I think it really depends with millennials if they feel like they have a candidate that they can support. One of the things that a lot of people find confounding about millennials, and this is a really interesting dynamic, in the 2008 and 2012 presidential elections, a lot of millennials liked Ron Paul, who does subscribe to the libertarian vision, as you described it prior to um, this part of our conversation. And a lot of libertarians liked Ron Paul, who's, you know, or excuse me, a lot of millennials liked Ron Paul, who was pretty libertarian. Now you see a lot of millennials coming out for Bernie Sanders, who's openly describes himself as a socialist. And so some people look at that and say, well, isn't socialism the opposite of libertarianism? And in a lot of ways it is, insofar as socialism does view government largely as a solution to problems. But also, there are some dichotomies where a lot of times socialists are maybe a little less interventionist on foreign policy, or they might be against the drug war in the same way libertarians are. And there may be some alliances on social views in terms of personal freedom. And so I think that a lot of young people, to the extent that they lean libertarian, it largely is in some of those aspects. And poll do, polling does show that millennials have a favorable view of the term socialism, yet as they define it, it's not socialism the way it's defined in an academic context. They almost see socialism as just, you know, sharing or working together. They don't see it as kind of a pernicious economic system, and frankly, they didn't live through a lot of the things that older generations did when socialism was a scary word. And so it's really fascinating because the polling does show that millennials have a favorable view of socialism, but they also have a favorable view of the term libertarianism in a way that older generations don't. So that dichotomy is very fascinating and can lead to different political outcomes. Um, I'm not a huge fan of Bernie Sanders myself, but for me, I would like to see young people more willing to rebel against the status quo. And if we can find the right libertarian candidate in the future to engage my generation, I think we've seen evidence with Ron Paul that that's possible. And I think we can do it again in the future as well. Yeah. I think my, many of them didn't have the opportunity to uh, be exposed to all the uh, news reports and, and other uh, information when uh, oh, Mao Zedong and Paul Pot and other prominent socialist authoritarians were basically slaughtering a lot of their population for the, quote, good of, good of their people, uh, yeah. to uh, the good for the greatest uh, many of people. So, um, like, I, th I think you're correct in that most of the people don't associate with socialism with any actual implementation that has been tried, which inevitably leads to a lot of centralization of power and uh, violence, even though it appears to be a very, uh, you know, social media kind of uh, based phenomenon, when in fact, in socialist countries, there's always a strong arm that's in charge of things to make people behave the way uh, they are supposed to. Yeah, and the other thing too is that Bernie Sanders and his supporters, they like to describe their vision for socialism as democratic socialism, and they try to say that that differs from the type of dictatorships that you were talking about. Now, they try to use um, models of European countries. They say, oh, well, they provide universal health care, so that's democratic socialism. So they, I think the term socialism has evolved in a way, away from kind of that scary dictator type of thing, more to just social democracy. And I think social democracy does have problems in and of itself. Um, you look at a lot of these European countries, especially the ones that Bernie Sanders cites. He talks a lot about Denmark and Sweden. If you look at the statistics, over the years, especially since the 90s, these countries have been moving more toward a capitalist system, while the United States is moving away from a capitalist system comparatively. And so it's very fascinating. A lot of these European countries that Sanders and his social democrats support one of the reasons that they're doing better or well, even though they still don't produce nearly even close to what the American economy produces, but yet they're moving more toward capitalism. And it's just, I think for them not to quite see that, it's just really a definition of terms, a confusion of terms, I think. Sure. And that's one of the reasons that older generations, they reject socialism. But frankly, a lot of older people do support the type of policies that Sander wants, Sanders wants, whether it's something like expanding Social Security or Medicare. Um, I don't think it's quite the kind of scary, almost communist type of socialism that, that a lot of people think of when they yeah. hear that term. And of course, it goes back to people that uh, control the terms 
uh, that we use often control the debates, which I think is what's uh, happening with this. But I, I think people would be well uh, advised to remember that uh, the term uh, that's generally reviled in all circles, Nazis, are basically the National Socialist Party of Germany. So I know. if you want a uh, tie in to social, what socialism means in practice, that's uh, not a bad uh, kind of a thing to, to, uh, to look at. I also know that, um, or I've heard that the ambassador, I don't know if it was the U.S. ambassador, the Sweden's ambassador to the U.S., has been on public record is to ask Bernie Sanders to stop calling his country a socialist country yeah, I, because they, <laughs> they said they were really a free market capitalist country. We're not socialist. Now, we may have a big welfare state, but we're not a, a, a socialist country. So Exactly. And that's where the confusion comes in as to the difference between what Sanders wants to call you know, he calls it um, democratic socialism. Right. I think what he really just means is democracy. And he hopes that democracy will yield a big welfare state, but it doesn't always. No. Um, a lot of people don't necessarily want that big of a government. And that's where the confusion in terms, I think, comes in. But that's why I'm also optimistic about the millennial generation, even though if right now they're very enthusiastic about Sanders, I think you saw that enthusiasm for Ron Paul, as I mentioned. And I think largely it is um, partially the fact that they're you know, a little more pro-liberty possibly than older generations, even if they do have some un unfortunate, you know, socialist tendencies. But I also think that what my generation is looking for, and there's a lot of data to back this up. There was a Pew survey um, maybe about two years ago now that was taken that shows that millennials specifically reject big institutions in general. We're very skeptical of government in its current form. Um, we're less likely to be involved in major institutions, including religious organizations. We're just very skeptical of all these big organizations, including big corporations. And so we are we see the corruption, and I think what we're looking for is somebody genuine. And for all my policy disagreements with Bernie Sanders, I do think he comes across as genuine, largely in the same way Ron Paul did. Some people don't understand, how can young people like these, you know, weird old white guys? They just, they don't understand, but it's, it's that genuine nature, yeah, and their, a... their philosophical purity, in a way, I think really does appeal to my generation, looking for something where we just want someone who's not corrupt. Exactly, and I think uh, their honesty, Ron's and Bernie's honesty comes through in their uh, their uh, presentations and all you can tell that they really believe what they're what they're talking about and generally they're not uh, they're not uh, uh, at play with the lobbying and groups and they're yeah. not uh, uh, in the hands of a lot of, uh, of uh, political money and contributions that go on they're going to say what they believe regardless of uh, how many or few exactly. comedy, uh, uh, contributions they get. I thought it was interesting. They had a little uh, uh, vignette on the, uh, YouTube about uh, uh, Bernie, how he always uses uh, Uber wherever he goes to all of his uh, speaking engagements. And I think that uh, speaks to what you uh, talk about, uh, maybe millennials being more uh, receptive to not uh, big institutions, all this kind of... Uh, peer-to-peer -peer business model yeah. that's emerging of uh, sharing Uber or Airbnb mm -hmm. and all where uh, it's kind of a people-to-people -people, uh, economy that uh, uh, that is uh, coming to the forefront, primarily in the service industries. I don't know how you build automobiles or airplanes with a peer-to-peer uh, yeah. -peer, uh, economy, but nonetheless, it does put the human beings back more in the link of uh, your economic transactions, and you can see how... Uh, uh, relating to other people economically is for everyone's benefit and eliminates a lot of yeah. the middlemen and yeah. other things in that. I think that's very true. And unfortunately, in my view, the ironic part is, is that I feel like a lot of the people in my generation, I just don't think they quite understand the extent to which Bernie Sanders' policies would really expand government. Because when you hear what he says on the surface, it sounds good. He says, let's get money out of politics, right? Okay, that sounds great. There's so much corruption. There's corporatism. Unfortunately, he conflates capitalism and corporatism. He, said, he basically assumes that the free market is what allows people to buy politicians. I always say, if you don't want politicians to be bought, don't make the government big enough that it's profitable. Right. You know, and that's kind of the libertarian view, whereas he says, let's have more 
for regulations to get money out of politics. But as someone who's worked in the nonprofit sector, I can tell you the only thing that those types of campaign finance regulations do is help the people who have enough money to navigate the laws, really. If you have enough high paid lawyers, you can navigate any campaign finance law. If you're just a small nonprofit organization or a grassroots group trying to incorporate into one, you're not going to be able to afford all of those regulations and all of those hoops that the government puts out. So really it becomes an incumbent protection program. And I know that Bernie Sanders supporters mean well on that, but I just think the surface level of anti-corruption appeals to them and they maybe haven't entirely thought through the whole bulk of what it really means. Because like I said, polling does show, and I know you have some of the data from the Reason Foundation, which did a poll on millennials, and it does show that we are against corporatism, but we actually are for free market policies when you break it down and explain what those mean. And I think that's really important to know. You can't just assume that young people are socialists because of that term. You have to look at the policies, and the policies show that we're actually pretty libertarian as a generation. Yeah, I hope that's a, a good sign coming. Let me also encourage our, uh, our viewers uh, there's a number on the screen now that you can call in and ask Corey or myself any uh, questions you have about uh, millennials or uh, political uh, uh, public policy in general. So let me encourage you to call in the number on your show, 713-807-1794. We'd uh, love to hear your questions and uh, take time to, uh, to answer them. So uh, yeah, as we go on to, uh, to talk a little bit more about millennials, I know they've been... Uh, and even in the in the narrow age group that they are, a lot of uh, millennials have been uh, characterized as uh, people that uh, live in their parents' basement and uh, don't have a job, which is you know maybe harder to come by than when maybe you and I graduated from college or not. But uh, <laughs> there may be a lot of them that still do live uh, with their parents. But uh, that's uh, probably not a uh, a realistic. Uh, uh, portrayal of millennials in general, especially the ones that are, are, are older, on the older end of the spectrum. They're not living in their parents' basement. But I know, uh, I don't know if it's Bernie or somebody that talks about the, all the people that are living with their parents uh, still. Yeah, well, I think millennials have gotten a really kind of the, the brunt of a bad economy. Um, like I said, I just turned 29, and I graduated from college in 2009. That was pretty much right after the Great Recession kind of took a hold of the housing market and took a hold of the economy in this really terrible way. And so I think it's very unfair to characterize an entire generation as just lazy when pretty much a lot of us graduated from college or high school even or maybe we're in grad school when really one of the worst economic calamities happened in this country within recent memory. And so I don't think it's fair to say that that's against one generation. You also have to understand, too, that we've been hurt by policies that were well-meaning. Um, student loans is an issue that's really, really big with millennials. And a lot of times, and this is, again, the problem with Bernie Sanders, he says he sees this debt, you know, people take on hundreds, maybe not hundreds of thousands, some people do, um, but a lot of times, you know, private schools, it can cost over 30000 a year to attend a school like that. And unfortunately, the government has created incentives where they infinitely subsidize tuition. And so there's no incentive whatsoever for colleges to lower tuition. What they keep doing is they just keep hiring more professors and tenuring them and paying them ridiculous amounts of money. They make these huge stadiums. They have all these state-of-the-art facilities that really do not reflect the true market. So you have young people borrowing and borrowing to go to these lavish universities, and then the degrees become less even valuable in the market. So it's kind of this perfect storm of a situation where what started as let's give more people access to college has actually ended up hurting people and leaving them with debt that is just insurmountable. Bernie Sanders says he wants to make college free. That's going to be so much more expensive overall, and then the degrees really aren't going to quite hold as much value in the market. So things that kind of sound good in, th in theory oftentimes lead to bad situations. And millennials, I think, we've taken the brunt of that, whether it's something like student loans and federal subsidies or even just the effects of the national debt. We now have $19 trillion in debt in this country, and that and the economic consequences fall on my generation in ways that really are unique to what millennials face. Yeah, it reminds me of a... Uh quote from uh, <clears throat> P.J. O'Rourke, who says, uh, if you think college is expensive now, wait till it's free, you know? And so, yeah, I think he said that about health care, but really oh, yeah, it's, I think it's, it was about it's the same thing with college, too. It's absolutely the same thing. When the government 
makes something free, what that really means is that they're taking money out of everyone else's pockets and then they're throwing it into this federal black hole, which really is not that effective. You know, the government does not it does not see market signals. It, it doesn't know how to create prices. And there's just, you know, all that corruption that Bernie Sanders supporters are against, that's enabled in government. It is. And so it just the government is not usually the best way to solve problems, even though politicians make it sound easy. Sure, student loans are really a payoff to one of the uh, strongholds of uh, democratic, uh, uh, Democrat uh, public policy uh, uh, initiatives, and that is the university level, which are uh, predominantly have always voted for a very progressive uh, a liberal agenda, and they're getting the payoff by having student loans. The ironic thing about student loans is, is here's the deal. Uh, I'll give you a student loan now, um, and of course, uh, if we make it free, it will just be added to the national debt, and uh, you get to pay me off when you're 30 and 40 years old, when you're actually making an income, uh, everyone's taxes will go up, and you will uh, pay your debt, uh, student loan debt that we've rolled into the uh, national debt as a Yeah, and taxes. also there's, there's so many unseen economic consequences, too, if you just keep piling debt on and on and on. There's no, it's not sustainable, and there are economic consequences, especially to raising taxes, especially when you raise taxes not only on job creators, you know, taxing the rich, that's going to have an impact down the road. If you want people to have good jobs, you can't keep taxing job creators until they can't create jobs anymore. Not to mention the effect of taxing the middle class. You know, to Bernie Sanders' credit, honest guy, he s talks about how, you know, he's going to have trillions in new spending and taxes. And guess who's going to pay the brunt of those? The middle class, because that's where the money is. And so is it really worth it for you to pay the government to do things inefficiently compared to what the market could do, it really doesn't make much sense. It just sounds good in theory. Oh, free health care? Cool, I'll vote for that. But it's not at all what people think it will be. And we have a lot of examples from countries abroad that show how much there's just wait times with health care. I mean, we even have the Veterans Administration scandal here in the United States. Oh, yeah, States. if you want to. The wait lists and whatnot. It's government health care, look at the VA. That's yeah, what it'll be like. Total disaster. You cannot vote for that. It would be awful on a national scale. So people really need to pay attention to what's actually happening, not just these kind of buzzwords that sound good. Yeah, they, some of the studies that come out, too, uh, you really have to uh, be pretty uh, uh, astute to look into some of the statistics that when uh, somebody like the World Health Organization comes out and ranks uh, health systems across the uh, world in terms of, you know, the United States comes out somewhere like uh, 18th or 19th, has the 19th or 19th best health care system in the world. Well, depends on what you use as your criteria for right. the health care system. One of the things they uh, tend to think to look at is uh, infant mortality and how the U.S. rates below uh, even some African countries in infant mortality. Well, uh, if you look at how they define uh, infant mortality, it uh, becomes quite clear in that it has to be classified as a live birth uh, before uh, infant mortality uh, statistics will come into play. Well, in some countries, a uh, live birth is only counted if the, uh, if the baby survives for 36 hours, mm -hmm. then it's a live birth. Whereas in the United States, uh, you know, we go to heroic measures to keep uh, very uh, uh, marginal uh, children alive for a long period of time at a great at a great cost. But a lot of them uh, obviously don't make it, and that contributes to us having a low infant mortality rate. Whereas if we just defined live births differently, our mortality rate would be much much lower in our health care system. And again, health care systems are generally based on well who has access to the health care, yeah. and that's another important factor in the World Health Organization. So if you read a survey that says, oh, the World Health Organization says the United States has mediocre or poor health care, you really have to look into what the way they define the it because yeah. people aren't flying to the United States for special treatments and other things or moving here from Canada to get uh, access to the health care system because it's such a poor health care exactly. system. Exactly. So, exactly. Uh, That's important to yeah, know. Yeah. So anyway, there's a lot of uh, a lot of stuff going on with definitions and yeah. how you have to pay attention to it. And, and this, is, this is one of the other things about Bernie Sanders. In one of the Democratic debates, or it might have been a town hall, but something that he was interviewed for, um, somebody asked him, 
how he can justify expanding health care when he was actually on the Senate committee that was dealing with the VA and the scandals there. And he, the way he brushed it off really rubbed me the wrong way. It's like he's so committed to his ideology and that we need universal health care for everyone that he doesn't care when we have one example of what actually happens when his theory is put into practice. And so that's the thing is he's, he's very ideologically blinded, I think, by his views. And um, I, I get it that it's appealing on the surface, but I know we were going to get a little bit more into the presidential election on both sides. I think um, the Republican Party is going to have trouble with young people, um, especially nominating a candidate like Donald Trump. And full disclosure, I cannot stand Donald Trump. I truly think he's the worst. I mean, as a libertarian, his authoritarian views are pretty much exactly opposite of mine. And so um, just the way he's come in and sucked all the oxygen out of the room has been pretty discouraging to me. But I also think it's indicative of um, people being frustrated with the system. And I get that. As a libertarian, I'm someone who's protested the system and been frustrated with the system. I was involved with the Tea Party movement from its, from its inception. But Donald Trump, the things that he promotes, um, tariffs, which would be a tax on imports that would very much negatively affect the middle class. This is protectionist ideas. Um, frankly, it's really fascinating to go back to Bernie Sanders. Trump and Sanders actually have very similar economic views. They are both opposed to free markets. They both think that they can use the government to force companies to stay in America, which that really doesn't work. Um, they end up leaving anyway, and things just get more expensive for Americans. But there's basically kind of this anti-establishment populism that you're seeing manifest itself on both sides of the political aisle. Unfortunately, I was hoping that that kind of populist angst would manifest into something a little more libertarian. <laughs> Unfortunately, it has manifested into something more authoritarian. But um, I still have hope for the future long term because I do think the millennial generation has better instincts. Um, but as far as this election goes, the, the whole Donald Trump um, thing is, is something that I, I think is concerning. And statistics do show that young people are very, very disappointed by the Republican Party and don't feel like it serves our interests. So there's going to be a lot of work for the GOP to do to appeal to younger um, voters, especially millennials. The good news is that the young Republicans that I know tend to be more libertarian-leaning, tend to be more open. I have faith in my generation of Republicans if we're able to stick around and fix this, but uh, right now it's not looking too good for the GOP as far as um, election prospects go with millennials. Yeah, I thought it was interesting that uh, really uh, Trump's... Uh proposed tax plan really out populists Bernie's. Yeah. In other words, Trump was going to go and put a, I think it was a 14% wealth tax yeah. on billionaires. Yeah. In that anyone that had, and this wasn't just an income, so you could hide it and play games with it. It's, you know, what's your total wealth? And if you have a wealth over a billion dollars, you owe the government 14%. They figured that uh, Bill Gates owed the U.S. government $10.9 billion oh as a result of his uh, Microsoft stock holdings and all. Yeah. So uh, that was a very uh, interesting uh, way of passing along the debt that didn't uh, actually affect this middle class the same way that uh, Bernie's uh, uh, proposal do. What it would do to the economy, I shudder to think. Right, but, exactly. Uh, but, you know, I think there's a certain populist appeal to, you know, what if somebody has more than a billion dollars? Is it really going to hurt anybody if we take a bunch of his stuff? You know, it's something you've really got to ap approach from a more principled uh, uh, viewpoint than that. Although yeah. I know uh, cer there's certainly a, a libertarian uh, aspect to issues about uh, it relates to inequality mm -hmm. and people like Bill Gates that has more money than... 25 countries in the world or sure. something. But uh, I know our friend uh, Stefan Kinsella would uh, say, well, the reason he has that because he's got a government enforced monopoly on uh, Windows software. That's true. And if we had shorter uh, time frames for uh, intellectual property or maybe just no, no time frames mm -hmm. for intellectual property, people would not be able to accumulate that kind of wealth uh, just by having the government protect uh, their uh, their intellectual property. So yeah. it's a really That's interesting uh, debate about how much protection does intellectual property need 
and uh, especially as it relates to patents, uh, maybe there's a case to be made for trademarks or maybe uh, in course of, uh, of uh, authors and people producing mm -hmm. movies. Uh, I don't know what all that might have, although the music industry has had to get around the issue of basically everybody being able to download. Uh, oh, with today's technology, yeah, absolutely. With today's technology had to uh, uh, address that problem. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, has there, I'm not a big current popular music <laughs> uh, aficionado, but has it really affected the quality of, uh, of popular music that much? Have we really seen a, a dearth of uh, music since everybody can download it and save it and I, share it? I don't. I don't think so. Now, I don't have statistics on that, but I actually think, if anything, the Internet has helped to democratize what is popular. In the past, um, record labels really kind of had a market monopoly, in a way, on who was exposed. But today, there are people who've gotten famous off of YouTube. Um, very famous singers. Justin Bieber is one of them. Who, really? You know, got famous off of It's YouTube. not all good, has it? Yeah. No. <laughs> but, I mean... My point is, is that there's actually more of a market, I think, today now than maybe there was in the past because of that democratization. And that's the thing that I wish that liberals would kind of think about a little more is they talk about democracy, but the market is the most democratic force that really exists. And I think that that's really important to remember and to really drive home. But you mentioned intellectual property, and this is actually something I wrote about at Rare Politics. There was a major outrage recently about um, the guy Martin Schulrecki, I believe his last name is, who um, he ended up getting a patent for a HIV oh, yes. drug. Yes, yeah, that, uh, yeah I, th I believe it was an HIV drug, but it was, a, yeah. it was a drug of some kind that had been cheap. He bought the uh, yeah, rights Yeah, he, he bought the rights to it. And what a lot of people didn't understand, they freaked out about him and they said, oh my goodness, I can't believe this happens in our capitalist system. This is an outrage. But it happened because the government granted a monopoly where this was able to occur, where the patent was such that the FDA's rules and a lot of other regulations made it so that he was able to do this. So he was able to force out his competitors, it was the opposite of a market. It was the ultimate example of big government corporatism granting this man a monopoly and forcing no competitors to be able to come in and deal with him, therefore lowering the price of the drug overall. And so this is just so important because people reflexively say anytime they see something like that, they want to blame markets. But a market would bring in a solution to that because people would be able to actually compete. And so this is one of those things where I just, I wish people would look beyond the surface and say, wow, what are the regulations? What is the system in place that is allowing this to happen? Because it's so crucial. And this is one of the things I just want to, I really want the Bernie Sanders people to think about. Right. <laughs> and yeah, the Trump people, too. Yeah, they don't seem to too. make any distinction between, like we would, between crony capitalism and, and real free markets. Yeah. Uh, and so, obviously, the two do get... Uh, Intertwined in the in the public's uh, view of they what uh, what's what's going on, uh, of course one of the the main targets of most all of the uh, populists and I don't know not, maybe not so much uh, Trump I haven't heard him talk but certainly Bernie is uh, the energy industry mm -hmm. uh, which of course according to them is just rife with crony capitalists. I may be a little bit prejudiced because I worked in the energy yeah. industry for for forty years and I really didn't see that much crony capitalism going on. As a matter of fact, uh, any time the price of uh, gasoline went up by 10 cents a gallon, there was a congressional investigation as to why these prices were going up. I just have to say that anybody that thinks that the uh, oil industry is an effective, uh, uh, is in effective control of the market and are crony capitalists, uh, they would have never let the price of crude oil go from $100 a barrel to $30 a barrel and gasoline from $4 a gallon down to, what, $1.35 a gallon. They must be pretty bad at uh, whatever their government influence is if they've allowed uh, their kind of uh, profits and their revenue to have that kind of a decimation in today's uh, modern economy. And as a matter of fact, it may be uh, that they can serve as a... Uh, as a counteraction to all these manufacturing jobs that are supposedly leaving the United States right. because of low uh, labor costs. And it's certainly hard for, uh, if you're making a product in the United States and you can go to China and uh, find labor for 75 cents an hour uh, to do the same kind of things that you're doing here, it's very uh, uh, attractive to lower the price for U.S. Uh, consumers by using that cheaper labor. But I think what we're finding, and I've seen some instances of it, that people that uh, 
companies that are in a very energy intensive business, one of the most energy intensive businesses is aluminum. Mm. They use a lot of uh, energy and electricity to refine aluminate. And some of those, a couple of them anyway, are moving from Western Europe back to the United States because the cost of energy is so much lower here that they get a competitive advantage by some of this manufacturing being uh, uh, repatri uh, repatriated to right. the United States. Uh, so again, simply because of economic factors, not because of any patriotism or sure. desire to... Uh, and, and that's why markets matter. Yes, that, exactly. That's exactly why markets matter. And this is my problem with both the Trump and Sanders economic philosophy. They think they can essentially bully companies into either coming here or staying here with tariffs, but that would be an absolute disaster. You can't just raise the cost of goods in such a way that are imported that creates an incentive for companies to come here. That historically has never worked. People just end up paying more and overall it's bad for the economy because you're restricting the flow of goods and you're preventing the market from working the way it should. And so I get it. I understand that people are are upset and they've maybe lost their manufacturing job or people want more jobs to come to the United States. But the answer is not more government that will distort the market and really make things worse overall. You have to allow, like you said, create those incentives where they come back of their own volition. And that is to have a freer market and make it attractive for people to actually make a profit here, not by trying to bully companies into staying or making the cost of goods much more expensive for the average consumer. That just never ends well. Right. And what it generally evolves into is if we raise uh, tariffs on somebody else's goods, well, then they turn around and they raise the tariffs on our goods. Yeah, and you so, start a trade war. So we right. lose uh, the ability to export uh, those goods, and the whole uh, global economy kind of uh, shuts down. And uh, according to you know a lot of historians, that uh, the uh, Smoot-Hawley tariffs, mm -hmm. which were enacted right before, uh, well, in the late 20s when the uh, Great Depression uh, started was a major cause of uh, of that particular phenomenon of shutting down uh, world trade, trying to prop up prices internally, and eventually uh, some of those kind of uh, uh, pressures led to uh, the start of the Second World War. Even so, you don't uh, gain anything by trying to uh, build economic walls around your uh, your country. Although it's very uh, superficially appealing yeah. to somebody that's losing. Uh, their job to some lower priced uh, labor or something that, uh, uh, that will just, you know, make it illegal uh, for them to do that. Yeah, that's what's so tough about the situation, because I, I do sympathize with people who hear what Trump and Sanders are saying on economics and think it sounds good. I, re I really do get that because people are worried and they're scared and their economic livelihood is kind of being swept up in something where trade is good overall in the aggregate for the world economy, but people are being hurt by that. And I do think it's a public policy question we need to address. And I do think it's something that free market advocates need to acknowledge because people are being left behind. So what can we do? What kind of regulations can we change or repeal to create incentives where jobs are coming back without hurting the economy without creating these type of trade wars that you're talking about that really lead to global disruption. So I think there are things we can do. Um, one of the issues that I've studied that I think is really important is the issue of occupational licensing. This is usually more a state issue than a federal issue, but there are... It, there are just some absurd regulations around how long it takes to get really truly working class jobs. Women who want to braid hair or do oh. hair in general, you know, they have to take hours, hours, sometimes even years worth of courses that don't even have to do with their field of study just so they can get this occupational license. And this is affecting small business owners. How many would be small business owners are not actually practicing their craft because of really onerous and unnecessary regulations? I think we need to have basic safety regulations. I'm I'm a libertarian, but I'm not an anarchist. I do think that there, the government exists specifically to create safe environments. But, uh, you know, there's an example, a, um, a documentary produced called Locked Out about a woman named Melanie Armstrong in Mississippi, an African-American woman who was told she'd have to get a cosmetology license, years of work to do African hair braiding, which right. has been passed down in her family. And this cosmetology school didn't even teach African hair braiding. And then, you know, these women, um, especially, you know, single mothers or black women in poverty, they were not able to get jobs. Um, in, and they could have. They could have opened their own companies. Eventually, this did change in Mississippi. This had a good ending. And a lot of these women were able to get jobs. And there were amazing stories about how women went from being on welfare to being able to own small businesses. Right. And you can find examples of that if you just repeat certain regulations, I feel like that is a much better and more 
really more fulfilling path than trying to create these trade wars and tariffs and whatnot. That just doesn't work. We need to find ways to empower individuals to be entrepreneurs. Yeah, some of our friends at Institute for Justice have been fighting that hair braiding fight for a long time. They have. And it's, uh, they've won it in Texas and they've won it in every state that it's ever come up in. I don't know if it's been, I think there's enough precedence now that they just have to go to court and say, look, we're going to challenge this and the people will just uh, fall away from it knowing that it's an indefensible thing. Absolutely. Uh, and it's not just hair braiding. It's, it's a lot of occupations. Oh, I'm, one of the occupations that it seems to me would be the, uh, a very easy thing to, do, to take is a child care yes. center. But you try to open a child care center? Can you imagine the amount of regulations that you would have to go through in order to get to be a licensed mm -hmm. child care provider, even though... You live in an apartment complex where a number of other working moms go and you would just offer to babysit their children for the day to get a license. You'd have to have uh, special sized toilets for all of the kids. You'd have to have nursing care available if anyone got sick. I mean, it's just a hurdle. You've just cut off the bottom rungs on this economic ladder for a lot of people. That's absolutely true. And the thing is, is like I said, as far as childcare goes or as far as cosmetology goes, yes, basic safety issues, you know, with childcare, okay, do background checks on the people. There are things you can do, basic common sense things, but you don't need every single onerous regulation. And I think sometimes our, our friends on the left, anytime you say repeal, you know, X, Y, and Z regulation. They say you don't want any regulations at all. You want people uh, running yeah, roughshod? Yeah. Well, well, no. We can have a conversation about what's common sense and what's onerous. And so I do think that there is some hope on that end. Even President Obama mentioned the problem with occupational licensing laws. And so I think there is a kind of an understanding that that's one of the many sides of this issue where we can work on things. But to me, let's focus on that rather than kind of this protectionism that we see in the Sanders-Trump philosophy that really will just be dangerous and hurt people more than it helps. Yeah. Most it's <clears throat> all that occupational licensing is mainly pushed by professional organizations within the United yeah, States don't want competition. that don't want competition. Uh, from anywhere from the flower arranging people in New Orleans uh, interior decorators that want people to be licensed to be interior decorators. Yep. There's an interesting case in, uh, in uh, Texas uh, with the Texas Veterinarian Association. There's a very, uh, I've never heard of it, arcane uh, specialty that uh, people that are called uh, floaters, I don't know if you ever heard of it, they go in and they file horses' teeth down so that they have a very a, a more even bite okay. and don't uh, dislocate their jaw or anything. And it's people that pass that down to in their in their family and generations have been uh, uh, horse floaters for a long time. And the veterinarian association has now come out with a law that says you have to have a veterinarian degree from Texas A&M in order to go in and file any horse's teeth. It's protectionism. It's yes. protectionism, in, or more than protectionism, it's it's corporatism in a way. Yeah, it is. Um, they're trying to create a government monopoly where only they are allowed to engage in that industry. And again, this is the opposite of capitalism. Capitalists are trying to fight and make it so more people can compete, so that there are more jobs and there's more income for people, and also that costs go down for everybody. Exactly. So we need to follow that path more than just more and more and more government because I just I can't imagine you know that Trump wants to put a 35 percent tax on imports from China that would be an absolute disaster that would hurt the middle and working class people that are already suffering and I just um I know that not everybody has the the time or ability to think through these economic issues but it's really super important for people to realize that a lot of times what they're ending up doing is they're voting against their own economic interests because they're, they're afraid. And if anything, both Trump and Sanders have played on people's fear. That's what really oh, this election sure. cycle has been about is fear. Yeah. Another horse story from Texas is <laughs> that uh, you may have a uh, you may be a licensed uh, massage therapist for people. But it's illegal for you to massage horses. Oh, because you're that's not, rational. <laughs> you're not a, uh, you haven't gotten a veterinarian's degree in oh, order okay. to massage horses. So, yeah, uh, it's really <clears throat> talking about you just um, uh, straightjacket uh, professions and economy so that it just becomes like... A, what sclerotic, I guess, is the name. It just uh, everything is so cut and defined that there's no 
uh, flexibility and the kind right. of things you can get into. And, and exactly. And going back to the millennial generation, people say that my generation's lazy, but do you know how much harder it is to create a job now than it was in years past? That's, That's part of the problem is we talk about these entrepreneurs and these people who came up from nothing, maybe in your generation or other generations. Well, why aren't millennials doing that? Well, the government has made it virtually impossible. That is a large part of why. And so I think we need to think about that in terms of all the entrepreneurship and the economic opportunity. My generation is being robbed of that, and it's largely due to inefficient and, frankly, irresponsible government policy. Yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't thought of that, uh, that uh, thing, how that does. Uh, that's so hidden from most people's view as to, well, where do these jobs come from? I mean, right. oh, well, you know, they just come, they're just, they're just <laughs> they're materialized. Yeah. yeah, they're just magic. Of course, there'll be jobs and all. But you can uh, continue to uh, clamp down and more and more regulation. And uh, people talk about, oh, well, you know, it's just regulating business and whatever else. But yeah, you're, what you wind up doing is regulating people out of a chance to make their own livelihood and and uh, take over their own life economically yeah. and not be uh, uh, dependent on other people. I think uh, there's a lot of people on the left that would rather, they would rather see people on welfare than take a minimum wage job somehow or other. It's not uh, uh, humane. It's not uh, humane to have a minimum wage job. Where they'd, it's been better. We can you can have more dignity if you're on on welfare, and not just working for some. Yeah, I, I don't job. think that I don't think that average liberals feel that way. I think maybe there are some really committed, like true leftists who believe mm -hmm. that. I tend to think, you know, I grew up in Massachusetts. I know a lot of liberals. I think they tend to be well-meaning. I think when they think about issues like welfare and the minimum wage, their heart is in the right place. They're saying, I want to help people. I want things to be better for them. They think that minimum wage jobs are exploitation and that welfare is helping. I don't know that they're looking through the consequences of what happens. Speaking again of millennials, the minimum wage is a great example of something that prices us out of the market. Maybe not so much me, you know, I'm, I'm a little older now, but people who are getting their first jobs, like say me 10, 15 years ago. Um, I worked a minimum wage job at a dry cleaner when I was 16. And that was my first job, and it was great. That got my foot in the door. I, I finally had some work experience, and I was a kid. I didn't need to raise a family. Minimum wage was great. I just wanted to go to the mall with my friends, you know? <laughs> and so, yes, that's a very privileged interpretation, but at the same time, the point of the minimum wage is not to be something that you strive for your whole life. You, It, it is an entry wage. Sure. That's the point. And so when you make the minimum wage so high that people can't enter the market to begin with, well, what do you expect? Of course they're going to be forced to be on welfare. And that's not really that dignified. It, you know, people, I don't think people want that for themselves. They want opportunity. And so I think from a public policy standpoint, we need to figure out, okay, how do we move people from welfare to work? And raising the minimum wage is a good way to do the opposite yeah yeah it's uh yeah the fact that uh you can make a minimum wage job i don't think anybody is advocating that the, that's a great way to raise a family of right. four or five uh, but it is a, a first step for people to get their ex get some experience in the workforce exactly. itself you don't want to do that forever but you get a minimum wage job and you're put in touch with other economic opportunities that you uh, find out about and can move on to, or uh, at least you can put it on your resume that you sure. have a history that you, you know, will show up for work and, and are, are, are a reliable employee. And therefore, uh, you become much more uh, economically uh, uh, available and worthwhile to uh, your next, uh, your next employer. I think it's, um, it's interesting in, uh, in, in the times that I've been uh, to Europe, uh, the way that professions are viewed in Europe as a pays, uh, as at least it struck me mm. as being different in the United States, people that are waiters, that's a profession. Mm -hmm. That's a job you should have your whole life and that you should be able to raise your family on and therefore Generally speaking, at uh, in most restaurants, it's not a function of uh, tipping or anything else. It's built into the cost of the food where these are employees and have been, you know, waiters for years and years and years or taxi drivers. Right. All the, the kind of thing, jobs that 
in, in America are usually looked at as stepping stones or part-time jobs or ways of you know, making ends meet uh, in, the, uh, in the short term are treated as being careers in, at least in some of the European com economies that I've uh, been exposed to. So it's just a different way of looking, uh, looking at employment and the fact that, oh gosh, you know, I could choose one of these lower skilled jobs and I can expect to, you know, raise my whole family uh, uh, yeah. with this kind of a wage. I think that's what Sanders supporters want in theory. I think they want to create that. And I'm sure there are pros and cons to that. I'm not an expert on Europe's, you know, service industry or anything, but I just think knowing what I do about how economies tend to work that I'm sure there are also some adverse consequences of that in terms of prices. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, it's probably as much harder to be um, middle class. A lot of times in economies like that, you very much have a working class and a high class. The middle class almost doesn't exist when you have that type of structure. And so maybe that's appealing to some of Sanders supporters, but it would lower the overall gross domestic product of the United States if we were to go that route. And it would really decrease job creation overall. And I don't think people think that through. They just look at this one individual and say, oh, they can raise their family this way. They're not looking at the aggregate economic outcome of that type of system, I think. Right. Well, we haven't uh, gotten to talk much about the current uh, media phenomenon, which is uh, the Donald and mm -hmm. uh, how he has uh, seemed to have, like you said, sucked all the oxygen out yeah. of the uh, debate formats, I guess. Is there another debate later this evening? There is. is. There is going to be another debate on CNN actually right after our program concludes. So okay. if people want well, to turn I it over to CNN, they can do that. I um, encourage those political junkies to tune in to that again. I'm yeah. almost burned out. And I'm a little burned out of the debates too, um, but I often cover them for work. So we've got another one tonight, and um, I believe this is the last one because okay, the voting know. is really, you know, we're getting to the point where it's wrapping up. Um, Florida and Ohio are going to be the two next big races on the 15th, and those are winner-take-all states as far as delegates go. Um, I never thought, if you'd asked me a year ago, if Donald Trump would be the Republican nominee. It, it seems more inevitable every day, and I, I say that not from a happy standpoint. I think it's going to completely upend the Republican Party. I'm the type of libertarian who has tried to better the Republican Party. You know, I, I supported Ron Paul. I supported Rand Paul. Um, there are congressmen that I support. Justin Amash is a good example, a congressman from Michigan who's a libertarian. Thomas Massey from Kentucky. Right. You know, I've been wanting to get these type of people involved in the Republican Party. To me, Donald Trump sets our goals back um, in a really major way. Some libertarians think that it's good that he'll blow up the Republican Party and that maybe we can find a third way. Mm -hmm. I tend to believe, and I've written about this at Rare Politics, that it's not going to happen that way. I think that people will just acquiesce to Donald Trump and that we'll basically have two authoritarian parties, essentially. And we won't have a third option. We'll just have Donald Trump's authoritarianism and the authoritarianism of the Democratic Party with no pro-liberty way to really viably get anything through. And so I take a more pessimistic version, in my mind, of what Trump will do. Um, I think we already see it. You're starting to see conservative pundits. Not all of them. There is definitely a Never Trump movement going on on social media, hashtag Never Trump. But there's also people, um, including economists I respect, Stephen Moore, even, an economist who um, works with the Heritage Foundation, he's been praising Trump. And I'm like, God, you're supposed to be a free market economist. Like, mm -hmm. So that, that troubles me. And I am worried about the immediate future in that sense, um, what Trump is doing in that way. I hope that we can acquiesce people's fears in a more productive way than how Trump does it. But um, at the same time, the GOP establishment, I think, did bring Trump on themselves by ignoring their base. Unfortunately, I was hoping, like I said, it would yield a libertarian. That we were the base. Yeah, that, that we were the base and that, that we would get more of what we wanted. Um, unfortunately, the voters have shown that they're having a little bit more of an authoritarian moment right now. But it, it always ebbs and flows. I don't necessarily think it will be permanent. So we'll, we'll see what happens. But right now, in the immediate future, I'm, I'm not terribly optimistic about this election. One of the things you... Uh kind of took issue uh, with something I said earlier in the evening, and that, I, that was that I thought uh, that um, one of uh, Trump's appeal, uh, appeals to people was that uh, he wasn't uh, governed by the special interests. He has nobody that's, no industries or industry groups or unions or anything else that are bankrolling his campaign. As a matter of fact, uh, I don't even know if he has a bankroll for his campaign. He's letting the media do yeah. it. But you don't think that that's a, 
you don't you don't think that's a true perspective that Trump is not bound by the special interests? I mean, he, as I said to you before, he's the ultimate special interest in the way that he's given money to all politicians on all sides of the aisle. And I know business people do that. But the thing about Trump is when you look at his policies and the types of things he supports, it is very much authoritarian. It's, it's pretty much big government all around. You mentioned his tax plan. We talked about his tariffs. So, okay, he's not bought by special interests. But the thing is, is that he always talks about making deals. His whole mentality, his whole persona is going to be about going in and making deals. He doesn't have any desire to limit government or do anything that a libertarian would want. So I tend to think that, okay, he's not owned by anybody per se, but his own business record is, is not terribly impressive. Um, he's gone bankrupt a lot. He's inherited, he inherited money from his father. I, I read an article that showed that if he had just invested the money his father gave him, that he would have more money than what he's done with his business ventures. Oh, really? So I think the idea that Trump is some incredible businessman, I, I, I believe that's a bit of a myth, and it's, it's almost as product of the reality TV mentality, more so than it is actual reality. And um, I get it, that's appealing, but his policies will just be disastrous from my perspective. Yeah, even though he hasn't really, well, the few policies that he has come out with are pretty, right, uh, that he's articulated. Are, are, are pretty bad, yes, I agree. But um, he does have that, uh, that appeal that, uh, that uh, there's not a bunch of people pulling his strings behind, uh, behind the scenes. Yeah, it's and a surface he has level some appeal. Hidden, he doesn't have any hidden agenda, I don't think. I mean, he does, it may be hidden, it's probably hidden from himself as well <laughs> because he doesn't know uh, for sure what, he, what it is. But, you know, <clears throat> I remember we always uh, used to say, well, you know, there's something for everybody in liberty. And so uh, if he can be the uh, liberty deal maker, uh, you know, we'll, uh, we'll give you more liberty here if you'll give these people more liberty there. Yeah, uh, maybe we could uh, he hasn't foster really... something that, uh, no, I know he hasn't, uh, it certainly hasn't done anything to uh, warrant that particular uh, uh, perspective of him. But uh, yeah. nonetheless, uh, I, I, I think there is uh, something both scary and different about somebody that uh, doesn't have to w w check everything he says with the people that are writing the checks for him. Yeah, but his, his ideas are worse than a lot of the people. Yeah, well, I agree. They probably writing are. The checks. So, <laughs> uh, compared to Trump, I mean, <coughs> I just I just don't buy it that he's like anti-elite or anti-establishment. He comes from the elite. That's his, his whole background is elite. I mean, there are so many pictures of him hanging out with Hillary Clinton. He's He's part of the problem, in my view. I think the idea that he's revolutionary is not accurate. I think the only thing about Trump that's interesting is the populist type of sentiments we were talking about before, the idea that people are so frustrated that they want to upend this system. I think that's fascinating. I just wish they were doing it with better candidates yeah. because Sanders and Trump are not the answer. So there's a lot going on. Um, a lot of people have asked, you know, maybe two, three years ago, there was talk about libertarian populism, sure. especially as far as the Tea Party went and electing some of the politicians I cited before. People said, is there a, a degree of libertarian populism going on? I think populism can shift. I think a lot of times populist voters aren't thinking that deeply about policy, especially economic policy. If a libertarian is anti-establishment seeming, they'll support them. That's what happened in 2010 with the election of Rand Paul and others. And if they're populist, but also spouting kind of authoritarian ideas, those people would also support them too. And you see that with Trump. So for me, as a political activist, I've had to come to terms with the fact that populism has its own ideological perspective in terms of a spectrum there. And so, no, they're not automatically going to vote for libertarians. They will also go and vote for a demagogue if he sounds anti-establishment enough. And yeah, that kind of scares sure. me. <laughs> I think we were all hoping that maybe uh, Rand Paul could fill that particularly anti-establishment uh, yearning that everyone has. And it seems to me that there's a lot of uh, similarities between uh, uh, Donald Trump uh, and uh, Ross Perot. Back in, in the uh, 19, uh, whatever that, 1992, yeah, the 90s, early where 90s, just an yeah. outsider comes in and says, oh, yeah, I'm a deal maker, I'm a hard-nosed businessman, I'll straighten the country out. And, of course, uh, uh, Perot got a significant amount of the vote and pushed George W. Bush out of the office uh, right. by that time. So, right. well, thank you again for sharing your evening uh, with us and uh, look forward to your comments on uh, rare politics and uh and uh, keep in touch w with us, and we'll uh, see if we can't uh, find some more issues of common interest to have you back on the show again. You're 
always a great guest to have on and Thank enjoy uh, speaking with you. And so uh, for the viewers that uh, we've had tonight, I uh, hope you'll uh, tune in to, uh, to uh, her blog and uh, check up on what Corey is doing as well. And uh, until uh, next time on Public Affairs, Public Access, I'm your guest host, David Hutzelman, and have a good evening and good rest of the week. Thanks for joining us.